Well, uh, we thought we'd start out uh, this program being so close to Halloween uh, on a bit of a Halloween theme. Uh, so I think, you know, to start, we're all wizards at heart. Uh, we need to actually have uh, the ways in which wizard chemists are able to light candles for jack-o'-lanterns uh, without any matches whatsoever. So go ahead, Tom, show us. Can we have the lights down, Rob? So good, yes. So we have uh, ways of just, uh, is that gonna? The other one, yeah, the other one's stuck. Okay, you, do you wanna you want try the ones on the outside as well? Watch out for your. Good, so this is, this is basically part of the, uh, the Harry Potter training. Uh, <laughs> to be able to light candles without, uh, without matches. Uh, if we continue with the, with the, uh, the wizard theme for a moment, uh, there's a favorite reaction of mine that I wanted to start things off in. Uh, it's you know, called the Halloween reaction, and you'll see why. And we'll actually, actually use a component of this chemical reaction uh, a little later on uh, in the show. So uh, again, just to start off with this wizard theme, uh, let's, Bob and I will end up having these all mixed together. So we're just going to mix together three solutions. Ready? And we'll just sort of watch chemistry take place. Now, there's fantastic numbers of reactions going on inside this beaker. But we will see the net effect uh, as it slowly uh, reminds us of Halloween uh, in very, very uh, nice, colorful ways. So keep looking, uh, because here we have this wonderful orange pumpkin. Uh, and you may think all the reactions have stopped, but keep watching. <laughs> so we have the Halloween colors, red uh, and black. Good. All right. Well, let's start this uh, show out. The show is on the chemistry of cooking. Uh, and let me say right at the outset that my only credentials uh, for this show are that I love to cook, and I think I'm a chemist. Uh, I'm definitely a chemist, uh, and I know I love to cook. Uh, and so uh, why might these, you know, the combinations of cooking and chemistry really work well together uh, in a show. What is chemistry? Can I, you know, who, who can tell me a little bit about what chemistry is? Go ahead. Good. So uh, chemistry is, is the study of how when we mix things together we get some sort of, of, of a chemical reaction. Other comments? Yes, uh, we certainly observe the properties of different chemicals. And in cooking, uh, those properties are, in fact, very, very important. And knowing the differences between different chemicals in cooking is really very important. Any other comments? What other, what other thoughts? What is chemistry? Hmm? What, what is it that we do uh, I mean, you know, at the, at, well, when we're cooking? We are working with what sorts of species? I mean, when we mix things together, the chemical reactions are occurring. Good. So we use, we, we use heat often to cook things. Sometimes we use cold to prepare things uh, in the kitchen. We'll actually do examples of both, yes?
Good. No, that's very good because basically, as a chemist, we really are interested in how reactions occur between molecules, atoms and molecules. And these molecules, uh, really, it's the chemistry or the physics of how molecules interact that really is at the fundamental uh, essence of cooking. So actually, uh, I think we have uh, even our first uh, chemical demonstration coming our way uh, with uh, Chris Wilson's excellent uh, guidance. Uh, try, try not to touch it. Uh, can, can we come? So what, what we have here is uh, we want to illustrate the basic idea that all of chemistry and all of cooking is based on the idea of understanding the chemical compositions of molecules and the properties that they have. So I think what we have coming our way uh, is, in fact, a recipe with our little remote-controlled Halloween-style uh, blimp. Good. OK. So now, let me just, good. Thank you. You can probably get this uh, safely out of the way. Good. So here we have uh, our first recipe. And to get across the idea that chemistry really is about recipes, and that really, I think, is the very natural connection between uh, cooking uh, and chemistry, uh, let's just try a very simple recipe for the moment. This is one of my favorite recipes. Uh, it's the recipe for water. Okay? Now, water, as you know, has the chemical formula H2O. And we can make that out of combining hydrogen and oxygen together. So here's my first contribution to a, a, a chemistry cookbook for a refreshing, low-calorie snack. Try water. Uh, it's easy, fun, hardly makes any mess. Just add two cups of H2, one cup of O2, mix thoroughly, and ignite at a safe distance. Okay? Uh, it takes no time at all to cook, only about a thousandth of a second. Uh, doesn't yield much, just two cups of steam, but it definitely generates some interesting noise. Okay? So let's actually uh, show that uh, as an example. Now, you know, one of my flaws as a cook is that I never follow recipes, even ones as simple as that. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually not follow that recipe, and I'm going to just try making water with pure hydrogen. Okay? and just having it burn a little bit in air. And you can see that that really isn't following that recipe. What we're going to find is that it doesn't really like to go very fast until we're able to mix enough air and oxygen into the reaction so that we really are following the recipe, and then something very special will happen uh, when that occurs. So let's do that. What I'm going to do is take pure hydrogen, and I'm going to fill this uh, little uh, cone with, uh, full of, of hydrogen. Need to just okay. So I need to just hear it, make sure that it's nice and full. OK, so now I am not really obeying the recipe for this, because I'm going to try and uh, cook with just pure hydrogen. And you'll see, as we dim the lights, that in fact we do have a very little flame at the very, very top. So I'm a very bad cook, because I'm not really following the recipe. But I know that as this hydrogen burns off and brings more oxygen in from the bottom, I'm going to get better and better balance to the uh, exact ratios of my chemicals uh, as I have in my recipe. And then something quite dramatic is going to occur. But I'll tell you what, it takes a bit of time, and it makes a very nice noise just before it occurs. So we need to be very quiet. Can we have more lights down? So while this is happening, we are burning hydrogen off, adding oxygen in from the bottom. And if we listen very carefully, 
will hear something just before we get to exactly the right recipe for water. Good science and good cooking also There you go. Good. If we can have the lights back up. So good. That's our first example of chemistry and recipes. Uh, let, me, let me just back up for a moment for the adults in the audience. Uh, if those of you who are interested in this topic, there are some excellent books uh, out there. These are two very, very good books. I'd probably recommend the Harold McGee book uh, most of all, but the Robert Wolke book is very, very good as well. Very nice, nice, thick, yeah, here, we, uh, I'm not selling them. Uh, yeah, th these are purely, uh, I, I, you know, my brother gave me that book for a Christmas gift uh, many years ago, and Karen Leachman uh, got me that book just a couple weeks ago. They're both very, very good. Uh, excellent. So now let's uh, move uh, a little forward. What I want to do is uh, basically amplify on exactly the idea that, uh, that one of uh, our, our uh, verbal volunteers uh, indicated, that cooking really does often involve heat. Okay? Why do you think we heat things up uh, in order to cook? Makes it what? Makes things warm. Well, yes, and it's nice to have warm things, but you know, warm sand is not particularly tasty, right? You know, we, we need something. Warmth is good. What does it do? It can okay, it can also make sometimes cakes uh, help cakes rise. That's correct as well. Any any other thoughts as to why heat is useful in cooking? It can melt things. Absolutely. Any any other? It actually is sometimes very helpful at killing any bacteria, particularly when we're cooking hamburgers that come from uh, different sorts of organizations around the country. Yes? <laughs> yes. Uh, in fact, we move molecules by heating them, and we can make chemical reactions go faster when the uh, ingredients are heated up as opposed to when they're cold. I think we have a nice demonstration for that, but we're going to need three brave volunteers for this. Can you guys go find three brave volunteers for this? Oh, yes. Good. So this is Aaron, yes, and? Braden and Torin. Braden and Torin, great. So what we have here is a bit of the chemical reaction that we saw at the very beginning, at least the last part of it where the beaker flashes black. And what we have now are you know, ways in which we're going to mix chemicals together, and our volunteers are going to mix them and shake them. Uh, and we're going to do it in the following way. We're going to do it with cold uh, chemicals, we're going to do it with room temperature, and then we're going to do it with uh, hot or you know, uh, above room temperature sorts of uh, 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 re reagents. Okay? So uh, if we can have uh, Aaron and Torin and Brady, is it? Braden. Braden. Good. So uh, can we line you up uh, in some way? All right. Can we have uh, 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 people help? So your task is going to be turn around to the audience, right? And can you hold this? It's a little warm. Is that okay? All right, okay. And then uh, you know, what you're going to do is you're going to, uh, uh, all together, what we're going to do is we're going to pour these together, but not until I say so, okay? So now how about we spread out a little bit uh, and line up in a nice row here. So here we have a warm set of, 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 of chemicals. Here we've got a room temperature. And here we have, uh, I think you're, 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 the, you're the cold one, OK? So which do we think, uh, in which beakers do you think the chemical reactions will go fastest? The warm one, good. And which do you think will be the coldest? Yeah? 
as if <laughs> which will be the slowest the cold one good so we'll expect to see things happen let's check it out that's what science is making ideas suggestions hypotheses and testing them out okay so on the you know, why don't we just sort of direct them we will all count to three and they will mix the beakers one two three so mix and shake okay good so just start 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 shaking okay just just gen gently will do fine okay oh, there we go the hot beaker went first so the race is on Yeah. Number two. So now the question is, did we just put a you know dummy water reagent in there or you know is Aaron gonna be shaking this for another half an hour and just I know at this point she begins to go, boy, does this guy know what he's doing? It's okay, keep, keep going. Oh, there you go. There you go. Good. Thank you very much. Good. So we see how heat and temperature can be very helpful uh, in the cooking process. Okay? Now, probably the most important uh, ingredient uh, in all of cooking actually is not the food, it really is water. Water is an extremely important uh, aspect of all of cooking. Uh, and I want to you know, use some, just some simple demos to, uh, to explain why. Okay? So here we have, uh, it, they always say that you know, the first thing in cooking is learning how to boil water. So here we have uh, some water that is not quite boiling yet. I had to turn this off when I was loading the cone with hydrogen. That would have been a very unpleasant thing to uh, have those two flames communicate. Um, but we know something about the boiling point of water. What is the boiling point of water uh, at uh, sea level? Yes? OK, it's 100 degrees, but what sort of degrees? Celsius, okay? We sometimes also work in Fahrenheit, don't we? Yes, and what it is in Fahrenheit? 212. 212 Fahrenheit, 100 degrees centigrade or Celsius. Uh, that's the temperature that water ends up boiling at. How about um, at Boulder's altitude? Is there some difference maybe between where water boils at uh, in uh, New York City and where it boils at uh, in, uh, in Boulder? Yes. It's a little cooler here. Do you understand why? Do we know why water boils at a lower temperature here? Yes. Because we're a mile above sea level. Good. So why do you think that influences the temperature at which water boils at? Good. Yeah, the pressure is lower here, and that ends up lowering the boiling point. Yes. We are a very little bit further from the center of the Earth. Not very much, but in fact we are. But the biggest effect is that we're really further up in the atmosphere. And when we look up to the uh, outer space, there's less air above us pushing down. So the pressure is, in fact, lower. So uh, let me just uh, somehow another. Yeah, they always say watched, a watched pot never boils. I guess there's the equivalent here. A watched Erlenmeyer flask never boils quite. But what you can see, uh, you know, it, just for the moment, uh, maybe you can tell us uh, what number are we seeing here? 90, it's sort of bouncing around, but it's about 91, 92 uh, degrees centigrade. And the water is actually, you can see it, it's just starting to boil. Uh, uh, and it boils here. The temperature is at about 92 degrees centigrade, 93 degrees centigrade, substantially lower than what it is uh, 
at sea level. Okay? That has actually a fairly big influence on cooking uh, because when we cook eggs, for example, we need to boil them longer because the temperature is just that much uh, lower in that way. So you can see that the water is starting to boil and my number here is bouncing somewhere. Ooh, it bounces around. Oh, it's actually getting a little bit warmer than that, uh, but when it starts to boil furiously, it's going to drop back down to about 94, 93. Good. Uh, do you think we could actually then uh, make water boil at even lower temperatures? That's still pretty hot. Do you think we could make water boil at room temperature, for example? Is that possible? In outer space, if we had water in outer space, it would, in fact, boil at room temperature or even lower than room temperature. Now, I can't bring us all to outer space, but what I can do is I can take the property of outer space here, and that property, what is the property that you're referring to in outer space that would make water boil? A vacuum. Okay? So we have ways on planet Earth of making a vacuum. Now, what we need is a very dedicated uh, you know, planet Earth astronaut to come up and help us boil water at room temperature. OK, good. So let's see. So what we have here is a beaker of water. What is your name? Tyler. Tyler needs some safety glasses. OK. Uh -huh. And I need to put on, uh, Ricky, Ricky bought this hat for me. So this is sort of a nice, uh, a nice hat to symbolize uh, the, uh, uh, the cooking show. So good. So Tyler, what we need you to do is to use, let me feel how warm your hands are. Ooh, nice and warm, very warm but not boiling hot, right? Uh, but we're going to show how this really can be hot enough to boil water. But what we need to do is do it in vacuum. So Tyler, can you maybe, can, yeah, so just hold the bottom, OK? And, and you know, put, put one hand on the bottom and one hand maybe on the top, OK? All right? And we are now uh, making a vacuum over there. Now, can everyone see? Uh, maybe we want to. You know, Turn, Tyler, can you turn so that more people can see you? Can you see that Tyler's hand is actually making the water boil? Maybe we can move over so that some of the people that are uh, on the other side uh, can see as well. So Tyler's got very hot hands and a warm future uh, ahead of her. Very good. Thank you, Tyler. So, uh, yeah. Good. So we can see that there are very nice ways of uh, really influencing the boiling point of water, a very important aspect of cooking. Uh, how about the freezing point of water? Can we influence the freezing point of water? Yes, in the back there. What's that? Uh, it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And in centigrade, what is the freezing point uh, in centigrade? It's 0 degrees fa uh, Fahrenheit. So let me actually. Uh, uh, zero degrees centigrade. Did I say that wrong? Zero degrees centigrade. And so here we have a, a nice ice water mixture, and I can put my thermometer uh, in there, and you can see that the temperature uh, wiggles around a little bit, but actually, uh, it actually seems to say two degrees centigrade. Um, not quite sure why, uh, but it's basically very close to zero degree centigrade. Can we influence the freezing point of water in some simple way? Yes. We can add salt. Yes. And that's a very important aspect, uh, not so much in cooking, because we need to add a lot of salt to influence things. But it's extremely important in a very interesting uh, property of cooking, and that is when we want to make things like ice cream. So let's actually do that. Uh, and I'll just show you. Uh, I think I will show you. Uh, and the way I will demonstrate this is, is the following. I have a beaker of ice. Actually, what I'll, I'll do it a couple ways. One is I'll just take plain old Morton's salt, and I will add lots. Right? This is also an example of my cooking style. Right? Uh, complete abandon uh, in terms of these sorts of things. And as I uh, mix that up, I may need a little more salt.
this is somewhat refusing to drop down uh, below the temperature. Let me just add a little more ice. In that way, we will, and a little more salt, you know. I mean, this, is, this is good cooking, right? Well, we, we, will, we will watch that uh, occur uh, with time. But what I'd like to do is do it in a different way. I'd like to show you that I can take ice, which is just, after all, frozen water, and get it so cold that it can freeze other uh, uh, water. And the way I'm going to do it is just uh, take some ice. And I'm going to add, again, salt to the ice and stir it around. But as a way of knowing that it's going below the freezing point of water, I'm going to actually freeze this to a block of wood. So I'm going to put just a little bit of water on my block there. And then I'm going to add a pinch of salt. And I'm going to actually, again, wait uh, for a while uh, to see this. We'll come back to this in a little bit. But I think we will find that we've actually frozen the beaker to the block of wood uh, in exactly that way. This is refusing to go below zero degrees. But anyway, uh, good. Uh, Let's actually bring out a practical application of the freezing point. Uh, let me just pour a little bit of the excess water out here so that it doesn't have to freeze quite so much. Uh, and our demonstration of this will be of great utility at the end of the show, because what we're going to do is make ice cream. Okay? So what we've done here is we have actually uh, a nice mixture of, well, uh, Ricky, Ricky made this last night. Uh, but it's chocolate and eggs and cream and lots of nice things. But why don't we uh, 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 have you guys fill this up? But in order to lower the temperature sufficiently of the ice so as to freeze the ice cream, we're going to add ice and then uh, just plain old rock salt. This is the sort of salt that would be used maybe to melt your driveway. Uh, when uh, we get some uh, uh, snow or ice on it. OK? And we'll just get this all packed together with uh, ice and, and rock salt. Don't make sure the lid doesn't come up. Trying to make, yeah, the lid. Uh, and then we'll get that cranking so that we can uh, use that intense cold of ice with salt uh, to our advantage for uh, freezing uh, ice cream. I think actually we have uh, even a, a picture of what ice cream looks like. That's sort of fun to look at. Um, good. Um, uh, this is basically what ice cream looks like. Uh, it, it really is a lot of ice crystals uh, and a lot of air. So we are, need to whip in air uh, into ice cream. Uh, actually a relatively uh, large amount of liquid. When you eat ice cream, you might think that it's essentially all solid. It turns out not to be true. Ice cream is about 40% liquid uh, when you eat it, and it even just is in an ice cream cone. And it's held together by the nice ways in which these ice crystals, and I hate to call them, but fat globules, uh, 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 basically sort of hold these structures together uh, in a nice, creamy uh, way. So if you had ice cream that was so cold that all of the liquid had turned into ice, it would be like a brick, right? But good uh, Ben and Jerry's or uh, Hagen dazs or whatever uh, that you get uh, at the store really is still about 30 to 40 percent uh, liquid uh, in it in that way. Good. Um, yes, ah, excellent. So here's uh, the example of, uh, again, how we've now gotten this ice so much colder than water that it freezes water and holds it uh, to the block. So you can see that, I mean, I could, you know, it's actually quite solid on the bottom there. So we're going to uh, 
do exactly that. We're going to be cranking our ice cream with the salt in it, chilling it down so that we can have a nice refreshing uh, treat on this blazingly hot uh, Saturday morning. Good. Uh, I want to show one other demonstration concerning water that's rather interesting, uh, and that is a rather uh, nice application of uh, how we can increase the boiling point of water. Let me turn this off for the moment. Okay? If by lowering the pressure, we can lower the boiling point, what happens if we increase the pressure? Yes? It raises the boiling point. Now, can you think of an application where that's useful in the kitchen? Yes? It would cook things faster. How can we raise the pressure in the kitchen? Do we just basically seal off the house and pump you know, uh, oxygen or whatever into it until we're up at very high pressures? What do we do? Do what? A pressure cooker, yes. We can have a container where we boil water, but we contain the steam in a way that basically allows the temperature to get high. Uh, good. There's actually a nice application of that that you guys might not have realized uh, every time you did it. But uh, you know, every time you make popcorn, you're actually uh, utilizing, uh, uh, essentially, uh, each of these kernels as a bit of a pressure cooker. Uh, this is what the structure of a popcorn kernel looks like. Uh, if you were to cut one of these open, you'd find that there's a small pocket in the middle of the corn that has sort of wet, fleshy uh, material. Okay? But most of the popcorn kernel is actually rather hard. And so what happens is that nature has built its own little pressure cooker. And when we heat up popcorn in uh, oil, what happens is that, and I'll just What happens is that uh, the pressure inside the popcorn rises uh, because water, the water in there cannot boil because it's enclosed until the pressure gets very, very, very high. And as the temperature rises, that pressure gets so high that what happens to the popcorn? It pops. Okay? And it's in that popping. Uh, action that really represents ultimately the boiling of water, but at a very, very high pressure and rather high temperature. So every time you pop popcorn, you can really think of that as being uh, an example of uh, your own pressure cooker uh, taking place. We'll see if that that's going to start going any moment now. Okay. Let me now introduce to you, uh, you know, one of what I'd say are the three major areas or food groups uh, that we work with. And those food groups are, in fact, not pizza, ice cream, and Coca-Cola, uh, but in fact uh, are proteins, uh, carbohydrates, uh, and fats or fatty acids, uh, as, we'll, as we'll talk about them. What I have here is a nice example of a very, very common protein that you guys uh, were, is it starting to pump? Good. It, it'll, it'll get going pretty furiously in a bit. Uh, a very common protein, you guys can all recognize this. What do you think this is? It's egg whites. Egg whites are almost pure protein, uh, but actually with a lot of water attached to them. Uh, and it's the water mixed in with the protein that really ends up making the protein uh, have that sort of fairly slimy uh, feel to it in that way. Okay, good. Our popcorn is starting to pop. Uh, maybe we'll just watch it for uh, for a bit. Again, each time that kernel is popping, the water in the center is has risen to a temperature much higher than 100 degrees centigrade. The pressure inside the kernel is probably 20, 30 atmospheres, uh, in other words, 20 or 30 times the pressure uh, that we feel in this room. And that's enough to explosively uh, uh, you know, detonate, if you will, the popcorn. Um, and there we go. Nice popcorn. So it'll fill the room with popcorn smell, but 
If you're really good, maybe we'll give you a kernel afterwards. Good. Uh, let's, yeah. Uh, what I want to do is, uh, yes. Um, um, good. So uh, in the uh, protein in egg white has actually a great deal of water in it. And if we wanted to, you know, to, uh, to cook this, um, you know, we would put it over some flame and we'd actually, you know, watch it cook. What is happening when you cook a protein? Now, you know what's going to happen. This is going to turn, you know, nice and white, okay? What is it that happens when you cook a protein? Well, um, let me actually get it on this uh, little ring stand here and we'll just sort of see a little bit of what it looks like when it cooks. Good. So in the process of cooking for a protein, a protein is like a great big snake, very, very large snake-like molecule uh, with lots of water associated with it. Okay? And so when you actually have a protein uh, like that in your egg white, that big long snake is sort of coiled up in a relatively compact ball, okay? but still with lots of water uh, associated with it. And when we cook, what we're doing is what? We're warming this up, and we are actually making the molecules move faster, and the snake starts to uncoil. All right? And in doing so, it also releases a lot of the water that's associated with, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the egg, uh, with the egg proteins. And that basically ha then leaves all these molecules, these great big long snake-like molecules, uncoiled. And when they're uncoiled, they end up sticking to one another a lot better. And that's, in fact, exactly what happens when you cook an egg, is that you end up um, it, driving off a great deal of the water, uncoiling the snake, and having the snake stick to, uh, to itself. Okay, let me just, I'm going to speed this process up by actually removing uh, this little piece. We're going to go right, right to the flame here. This is not a very good way to cook an egg, I'm sure you can appreciate. Uh, but it's the exact thing that you are doing in your pans. And you can see that it very slowly turns white. Why is it turning white? Because the molecules are uncoiling and sticking to one another and forming great big masses of proteins that are then uh, you know, act as a big uh, unit. So you can see that uh, my egg whites are turning well, we call them egg whites. They're not really white until we cook them, uh, but they are now turning nice uh, uh, and white. And if you look very carefully, you can see that we are also driving water out. Can you see a little bit of steam coming off the top? Okay. So that really is the process of cooking, is in large way pulling the water, at least for proteins, uh, out of them, and then having these great big long snake-like molecules uh, uh, interact. Okay? I'm going to show you one uh, sort of dramatic, two dramatic examples of that. One that I do not recommend that you uh, ever do for your parents, uh, but that doesn't stop me from doing it here. Uh, and that is, it, I can think of ways of removing water from a protein that don't involve cooking. So here you can see the, you can see the water coming out very, very nicely uh, from my uh, cooking egg white. And let me just turn that off, because at this point, we're just going to start burning the egg white. We don't want necessarily that smell. But here's now uh, you know, just some eggs. And uh, let's say you wanted to you know, scramble your eggs. Well, one way to do that, of course, would be to, uh, to just put this in a hot pan and stir it and add salt and pepper and, uh, and serve it uh, to your family. Uh, it, but we can do it another way as well, and that is we can add chemicals that actually remove the water from the proteins. 
And in doing so, that will actually cook, or what biochemists call it, denature a protein in such a way as to generate the very, very same sort of scrambled egg consistency uh, that you're used to. Okay? So the, the chemical that I'm adding actually is ethanol. Uh, so this is uh, actually not a, uh, a particularly uh, savory, appetizing uh, morning uh, you know, meal. This is a hard egg. Uh, but you can see, uh, if, you look, if you look carefully, that just by adding something that removes the, uh, uh, the water from the protein, I mean, it looks sort of gummy and yucky, but then again, sometimes scrambled eggs do as well. Uh, let me add a little bit more of my ethanol here. Good. Uh, but you can see that basically I am really generating uh, a consistency of my, uh, uh, of my eggs. I mean, you can see that I'm truly scrambling uh, the eggs right at room temperature. Okay? So uh, you know, let me suggest that uh, no, no one come here and sort of try and, uh, and eat this afterwards. Uh, it's rather alcoholic. But nevertheless, it is truly a cooked, in every sense of the word, uh, uh, in terms of the proteins, a cooked egg. Okay, so you can come up and take a look at that uh, afterwards. Good. Uh, a very important aspect of egg whites and proteins in cooking is in their ability to be able to whip them. So here we have a picture of how egg whites uh, whip. Uh, because in very much the same way that you cook an egg white, whipping is like cooking in that it stretches out the protein molecules in such a way as to denature them. And they wrap themselves around air bubbles in a very nice way as to make a foam. So we have some examples of that. But we need two volunteers. But I need one child volunteer and one adult volunteer. So can we just you know, go get the people that want to come down? OK. Good. Excellent. Good. So what we have here are beaters, electric beaters, and egg whites. Wow, this is going to be a lot of egg whites. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to whip the egg whites. The motion of the beaters is really working to mix air into the egg whites, as well as stretch out the proteins so that they can interconnect uh, uh, and wrap around these air bubbles. Okay. Shannon and Francis. Good. OK, so uh, person your beaters. Okay. Now, here, b b before you start, because this is going to be a race. Okay. It's going to be you know, Shannon uh, and Francis. Francis. Good. Uh, but we're going to give the adult a little bit of a disadvantage. Okay? And we're going to learn about cooking at the same time. And the disadvantage is that it turns out that when you make egg whites and you whip them, okay? uh, yeah, what's that? You don't want fat, exactly. So just because you know, adults get all the good things, we're going to basically you know, uh, cause a bit of a problem here. So go ahead, start your whipping. Yeah, pump it all the way up. And just be, no, you're right. OK. Mm -hmm. Get, get, get it all the way up to the top. There we go. So in this process, we are really whipping air into the mixture and stretching out the protein molecules in order to stabilize these air bubbles. The problem is that uh, with the extra amount of egg yolk that's been uh, added to the adult mixture, it turns out that it makes the air bubbles too slimy. And the protein molecules then slide off of each other and can no longer really interlink. And so the air bubbles end up not being surrounded by protein uh, uh, in that way. So it just does not whip any, anywhere near as well. So it's just, OK. I think you're penalized enough, uh, that, that's probably fine. So.
Okay? That's probably good. Good. So I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll stop and compare. So we have, uh, you know, uh, I don't know which uh, sort of egg uh, uh, whites, whipped egg whites you'd like, but I sort of like these better, okay? This is, again, done in the absence of fat. Uh, this with a little bit of fat that can really come from accidentally breaking your egg yolk. So uh, let's thank our volunteers. Good. So we will take the successful egg white and let's do something fun with it. Let's actually uh, you know, imitate in some way the, uh, the way in which, uh, you know, I mean, why, why are these whipped egg whites so useful in cooking? It's that when we put them into an oven, what happens to the, to the foamed egg whites? What do you think happens? They bake. They certainly do bake. But before they bake, what do they do? If we put them in a warm oven, what happens? Yes? Yes? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not sure they caramelize, but I mean, because you know, uh, car caramelization is usually a process that's associated with sugars. But you're right, they definitely cook. But before they cook, they do what? They expand. Because we have air bubbles that in a warm oven expand very nicely. And so when we make a souffle, the idea is that the warmth of the oven blows up each of the different air bubbles. And then at the same time, and that's the magic of cooking with egg whites, it ends up cooking the egg whites, exactly as people were saying, where we drive out enough water so that the molecules start sticking to one another, just like when we cook an egg on a stove. And then when we cool the oven back down, the air bubble structure is now rigidified. And that allows it to be stable. Well, we're not going to cook these egg whites in that way, but we're going to do something, uh, I think, as neat. We're going to make the, uh, the foam expand by not warming it, but by decreasing the pressure. How do, am I going to put this in this? Um, that's going to be an interesting challenge. OK, so here. Um, so now, now you're getting an idea of what my kitchen looks like uh, after at least you know, my part of the cooking uh, is, is involved. <laughs> so how do we do this? You did such a great job whipping these egg whites that uh, um, uh, can can maybe you put those in? Uh, okay. Uh, do, do you have a stirring rod or something that yeah. we could just? Okay, we're we're getting that in a little bit. Uh, so. Uh, Tom, Tom will, will help me with, with that while we do a, just another simple uh, quick demonstration. Uh, and that is uh, a very useful uh, property of uh, after you've cooked eggs is to be able to recognize if you've cooked them. Okay? So uh, what I have in here uh, is uh, 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 a sample of four eggs. One of them is hard boiled and one of them and, and, and the rest of the three are completely raw, OK? So uh, what I want uh, uh, to do is have a volunteer help me determine which one is raw and which one is hard boiled. Ricky, can you? Uh... Good. Good. So wh what's your name? Alicia. 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 Good. Alicia's going to help me find out which one is the hard boiled one. And the way Alicia is going to do this is the following. What? You're going to spin them. Good. So because the hard-boiled egg is solid on the inside, you can tell very nicely by spinning an egg which one is uh, hard-boiled and which one uh, uh, is not. So maybe we can. Good. So Alicia is, you, uh, you, got, you want to be sure, because I really want to make sure that we get the hard-boiled egg. OK? Good, good. So Alicia says, this is the hard-boiled egg. And she finds out by spinning the two. And the one that's hard-boiled spins really nicely. Now, you, know, are you sure of this? OK, because I'm going to have you test by cracking this egg on my head. So go ahead. Just crack it on my head. 
Ah, very good. Thank you. And now, since Alicia has cracked the egg uh, 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 on, on my head, this allows me actually to look a little bit at the structure of a cooked egg. And uh, what's interesting about eggs uh, and their structure uh, is, of course, the egg white is on the outside. And the egg yolk uh, is on the inside, making quite a mess here, but uh, hopefully that's OK. Uh, and maybe some of you have noticed that when you cook an egg, that sometimes the yolk of the egg uh, looks all purpley, purple greenish, right? So can you see how the yolk here looks fairly greenish? OK, right? Have you ever wondered what that greenish uh, is coming from? Yes. Well, maybe you have wondered. Do you actually know what it's coming from? You have wondered. You don't know why. Good. OK, well, let's find out why. It turns out that that greenish color really comes from, maybe we can find it uh, on here, the, uh, going backwards, I think. Good. Uh, right. That greenish color turns out to be yet another chemical reaction uh, when you uh, uncoil the snake that is associated with proteins, part of the uncoiling process is breaking bonds that involve sulfur. And that generates what most people think of as the rotten egg smell, right? You know, and that rotten egg smell is really a compound of sulfur called hydrogen sulfide. Okay? And so the white in the egg generates hydrogen sulfide, and the yolk actually is very rich in iron. So what happens is that when you cook an egg, the iron ions in the yolk migrate to the surface and react with hydrogen sulfide and make iron sulfide, which is a deep black green, or actually it's really deep black uh, 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 you know, compound. So what you really are seeing, it's not that the egg has gone bad at all. It is, in fact, just a chemical reaction between iron from the yolk and hydrogen sulfide from the, from the white. And that really is, is what happens. And if, if, if you don't like that color, the best thing to do is chill your eggs very quickly after boiling them. And that inhibits the hydrogen sulfide from going very far in the white. Good. Uh, I think we have, thank you. Wow. Uh, so we have a huge amount of uh, you know, egg whites inside here. And what we're going to do is we're going to lower the pressure and sort of imitate what happens when you cook a souffle. OK? So uh, I guess we need the top. Good. So I don't know if we can, uh, can, we, if we can all, all see this. So if you can see, we are lowering the pressure uh, inside there. And can you see the egg whites? foaming and lifting and growing. Uh, this is like a souffle growing before your very eyes. Whoa. OK, excellent. So that's a very nicely whipped uh, egg white uh, in exactly that way. Now, what you've often heard probably how souffles can be very fragile. And what can happen is that if you change the temperature in the oven too quickly, too soon, what happens is that the souffle falls. Well, the exact same thing can happen here. I can imitate that by just changing the pressure. So I'm going to quickly bring this back up to uh, 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 atmospheric pressure, or nearly so, and, <laughs> and my egg white just uh, fell. So this would be the worst souffle to serve uh, 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 of all. Now, you know, this was just so fun. We just discovered this just before uh, the, uh, the show today. Uh, you know, uh, and we, we realized that you can do this with marshmallows, and that's actually rather cool, too. So let's just you know, uh, have some fun uh, and watch. OK. But the marshmallows, interestingly enough, after they sort of you know, like puff up a little bit, they sort of give up the ghosts. They're not quite as good as souffles. But if I think if I, if I uh, undo this, we'll see this. All the marshmallows go away. 
Good. All right. So now, now we have some idea of uh, what happens with proteins. Uh, let me just very quickly uh, talk a little bit about uh, carbohydrates. That's another uh, complete area of cooking. Let me put on my hat, because I'll, otherwise I'm going to lose all my good thoughts here. Uh, so you know, uh, when we think of a carbohydrate, we think of things like, like what? What are some examples of carbohydrates? Bread. Bread's a wonderful example uh, of a carbohydrate uh, made out of flour that then rises uh, you know, due to uh, uh, yeast, typically. Okay? What, what are some other examples of carbohydrates? T table salt is a very definitely an interesting chemical. It doesn't have much carbohydrate in it, but there is something else that's on a table. Yes? Table sugar, table sugar for sure, uh, is a nice example uh, of a carbohydrate. Other examples? Pasta, wonderful. Okay, uh, Flour mixed with actually eggs often in pasta. Other examples? Rice, very, very good. All examples of carbohydrates. What do you think the word carbohydrate comes from? Any ideas? Yes? Carbon, right, and what? and water, carbohydrate. I think probably a good example of that uh, I can show right here. Okay, So I will take table sugar, as you said, and I'll show you that it's got really a lot of carbon in it. And the way I want to do that is by extracting water from the sugar. And I do that with a fairly aggressive water lover, uh, which is sulfuric acid, as it turns out. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add this to the sugar. I think I need to mix this up a little bit. And I'm going to put this over the top uh, and just sort of watch for a bit. Okay? But I think those of you can see that it's turning sort of dark, darkish. Uh, there and it's sort of starting to boil a little bit. It's getting pretty hot in there, in fact. But I think we'll see something uh, interesting happen in a moment. So you can see it's all turning black. Black, I think, is the right indication because black is the color of what? Carbon. So we're actually seeing the carbon in carbohydrates actually being uh, generated uh, in a very, very nice way. Let's see. I think if we're a little patient, we'll actually see, aha, my goodness. Uh, there's some nice chemical reaction there and uh, generating now lots and lots of carbon. This is sort of the same thing that happens when you burn your marshmallow uh, on a camping trip, right? It uh, turns essentially into very pure carbon by driving all the water uh, out of your carbohydrate uh, in your marshmallow. So good, an example of carbohydrates having now both carbon uh, and water uh, in them. I think I have w one demonstration that allows uh, those uh, many of you to come up. So let's see, can we have six able lung-bodied uh, volunteers? And what we're going to do now is we're going to show that we, when we eat sugar or whatever we eat, that we actually generate another byproduct from our carbohydrates. Uh, what do you think that is? When we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out, what do we breathe out? Okay. Do we have six? Good. All right. Good. So uh, our able-bodied volunteers are? John. John. Chloe. Chloe. Joe. Joe. Meg. Meg. Yes. Brendan. Brendan. And Brady? Flory. OK, good. So what we have uh, here uh, in our volunteers are very vigorous uh, carbohydrate burning machines. And when we burn carbohydrates, we breathe in oxygen and we exhale what? Yes. Carbon dioxide, exactly. So we are going to actually be able to test for that 
uh, we have a solution that has a little pink indicator in it that will, uh, uh, that actually is a test for, in, in essence, carbon dioxide. So what we're going to do is we're going to blow through straws. So here, each take a straw. Okay. Good. Good. Chris, you want to hand out uh, the beakers there? We're going to have a race. We're going to see who is the most efficient carbon dioxide generator. Okay. Uh, so they're going to blow into these beakers. Uh, they're all identical beakers, all identical solution. So hang on, because we're going to have a race here. Okay. Um, and we're going to blow in here, and we're going to watch the color go away as they generate carbon dioxide uh, and blow it into there. Okay? Now, there, there's only one warning, and that is that the color indicator uh, is, uh, I mean, it's a, everything's very safe. Uh, it's just that the color indicator actually also turns out to be the major ingredient in X-lax. Okay? So uh, don't, don't, don't suck back in. Uh, <laughs> just blow in. So let's, let's start them off. One, two, three. Blow. Okay? So they're each generating carbon dioxide from the Wheaties that they ate this morning. And you can see that, uh, there we go, we've got a clear solution, a clear solution. Good, excellent, excellent. And you can see that they've all been putting CO2 into their solutions uh, and uh, uh, as evidence of carbohydrate burning in their bodies. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, we need to wrap this up. Um, so let me do uh, one other demonstration uh, that basically sort of gets us into the world of fats and cheese making. And this is a nice lead in because we have some samples for the adults of goat cheese uh, in the back provided by uh, Haystack uh, Goat Cheesery. Uh, and uh, uh, Ron, uh, Hester Nadell is going to uh, help us distribute that towards the end. But this, you know, the story of cheese making is really quite interesting. It's sort of a mixture of proteins and fats, uh, but there's sort of a nice piece of chemistry that's associated with cheese making, and that's the following. Milk uh, has a lot of proteins in it. Uh, the proteins are called casein proteins or milk proteins. And what's interesting about them is that they're all little balls that are surrounded with negative charges on them. Okay? And because they're all negatively charged, the balls basically repel one another uh, in a nice way and ends up making that the balls don't just drop to the bottom of the solution. That's why when you put a you know, bottle of milk in the refrigerator and you take it out, it just looks white day after day after day. Okay? But if you add a little bit of vinegar to it, and you can do this in your home as well, what happens is that you change the charge on your little milk particles. And what happens then um, is that those milk particles are no longer charged. And as a result, they can start to stick together. Remember, we talked about how egg white proteins uh, unfold and stick together. The same thing occurs uh, in, uh, uh, in milk. And that's the start of making cheese, OK? Because what happens is that you generate then uh, big lumps. So what I'm adding is a very simple household acid that is vinegar. And let me just add a little more. And I think you know if I can. This sometimes happens spontaneously in your refrigerator as well. You've noticed that if you have really old milk in the refrigerator, that it, uh, it tends to uh, look sort of you know, curdy. That's exactly what's happening. And if I just wait a, a, a little bit, I mean, you, you can sort of see the, the way it looks like on the side. Now, this is, we use whole milk here. There may be a little bit too much fat in that. Don't know. Uh, but what we're doing is, again, making, and th this will take a little time for this to settle out. So maybe we'll see it uh, uh, you know, as you come up afterwards. But what we are doing is making those charged particles neutral 
and then having them all come together uh, and make essentially uh, something that looks very much like cottage cheese, a very loose cottage cheese in that way. Okay? And that really is the start of the way we make cheeses uh, by essentially uh, agglomerating uh, all the milk proteins together. Uh, so if you come up uh, in a bit, you will be able to see this looks very cottage cheesy. -y. And it looks, in fact, like what we would think of as sour milk or bad milk. But in fact, it's really the start of uh, the process of making cheese. OK, well, let's see. Um, is there? Uh, good. You know, I think actually, uh, given the time, what we should do uh, uh, is our is our ice cream ready? Almost ready. Okay. Well, why don't, why don't we bring it back in? Uh, well, let me just uh, uh, you know, finish by saying uh, again, thank you to all the helpers uh, that are involved here. Thank you for coming. Uh, and please come up and ask questions afterwards. Thank you. Make sure you get to sample some of the ice cream that we've all made collectively here. I think uh, Hester has some cheese samples up at the back. And may I hope that you all show up at the next Wizard Show, which Karen will be when? November 16th, third Saturday of every month from now till June. So thank you very much for coming.